Welcome to the philosophy of today. I'm Jim Hammond. In 1968, a documentary called Civilization appeared. It was made by an English art historian, Kenneth Clark. It was about 12 hours long. Viewers were much impressed. The documentary was an international success. In fact, the US Congress halted its proceedings and showed Clark's documentary in the Capitol. Clark became a celebrity, and he received 40 or 50 letters a day. The BBC announced recently that they are making a new version of Clark's civilization. Clark's documentary was a eulogy of the Western cultural tradition. This tradition had been battered by two world wars and by the counterculture movement of the 60s. Clark had faith in Western culture at a time when most people had lost that faith. Clark received nine letters from people who said they were planning to commit suicide but changed their mind after watching his documentary. If nine such people wrote to him, imagine how many more had the same experience but didn't write him. Surely the number is at least 100. Clark's documentary didn't explicitly offer advice about the art of living. Clark didn't talk about everyday life. He didn't coach people to take a positive attitude, etc. Clark talked about Michelangelo, Beethoven, Chartres Cathedral, etc. And by doing so, he made the world seem more interesting, more beautiful, etc. Clark's example shows that culture can be life enhancing, culture can enrich life. Philosophers often argue that the purpose of culture is to enrich life. For example, Nietzsche wrote, art and nothing but art. It is the great means of making life possible, the great seduction to life, the great stimulant of life. There is no such thing as pessimistic art. Art affirms. Such remarks are liberally sprinkled through, through Nietzsche's works. When I discussed the occult, I said that even if you don't believe in the occult and aren't interested in it, you may want to learn something about it because it plays an important role in literature, etc. I would say the same thing about the life-enhancing function of culture. Even if you don't believe in it, even if you take a different view of culture, it makes sense to become acquainted with this view because it plays such an important role in Nietzsche's philosophy and in philosophy in general. Just as we can argue that art is life-enhancing, so too we can argue that the purpose of religion is to promote life. For example, we can say that the religious rule against eating pork is a way of avoiding trichinosis. And we can say that the religious rule, thou shalt not kill, makes it easier for people to live together, makes it easier for society to develop. This brings us to an aspect of philosophy that we discussed in an earlier video, namely the biological aspect of philosophy. It can be argued that everything man does, including art and religion, is a way of enhancing life, is advantageous for our species. According to this view, art and religion serve a biological purpose. There are techniques that our species uses to promote itself, just as bees and ants and other species have techniques to promote themselves. When we discuss philosophical questions, we often find ourselves wondering, what is cause and what is effect? Is culture a cause or an effect? Is culture causing us to live better and more happily, or is culture an effect of a deeper cause? Is there, as Freud argued, a life instinct in all organisms, including man? And is this life instinct pushing us to live, to survive? Is this life instinct pushing society to develop, pushing art and religion to develop? Is culture a cause or an effect? Personally, I think we do have a life instinct, and I think this life instinct does push us in certain directions. But I also think we have a certain freedom. Our art and religion are as much a product of this freedom as a product of our life instinct. So I don't think we're in the same boat as ants and bees. Let's come back to Kenneth Clark. Clark made the documentary Civilization when he was in his 60s. When he was in his 20s, he worked for the art historian Bernard Berenson, who lived outside Florence. Berenson argued that great painting is life-affirming, life-enhancing. It makes one feel more alive. 
One way it achieves this is through what Berenson called tactile values, the creation of forms that have a three-dimensional, touchable quality. An example is a work called Battle of the Nudes by Paul Aiulo. The pleasure we take in these savagely battling forms, writes Berenson, arises from their power to directly communicate life, to immensely heighten our sense of vitality. Look at the combatant prostrate on the ground and his assailant bending over, each intent on stabbing the other. See how the prostrate man plants his foot on the thigh of his enemy and note the tremendous energy he exerts to keep off the foe, who, turning as upon a pivot, with his grip on the other's head, exerts no less force to keep the advantage gained. The significance of all these muscular strains and pressures is so rendered that we cannot help realizing them. We imagine ourselves imitating all the movements and exerting the force required for them. While under the spell of this illusion, we feel as if the elixir of life, not our own sluggish blood, were coursing through our veins. Let's turn now to another work by Palaiulo, Hercules Strangling Antaeus. Berenson says, as you realize the suction of Hercules' grip on the earth, the swelling of his calves with the pressure that falls on them, the violent throwing back of his chest, the stifling force of his embrace, as you realize the supreme effort of Antaeus with one hand crushing down upon the head and the other tearing at the arm of Hercules, you feel as if a fountain of energy had sprung up under your feet and were playing through your veins. Where did Berenson get this idea of art as life enhancing? Probably from Goethe. Goethe was Berenson's guiding light, his inspiration. What is the purpose of art, the function of art? Berenson said, all the arts, poetry, music, ritual, the visual arts, the theater, must work singly and together to create the most comprehensive art of all, a humanized society, and its masterpiece, the free man. Free within and free without, ready in Goethe's untarnishable words, to live manfully in the whole, the good, and the beautiful. What does this mean, the whole, the good, and the beautiful? It's not a religious ideal or a moral ideal or a cultural ideal. It's all three together. It's an ideal of personal growth, an ideal of the good life, an ideal of our attitude toward the world in general. It's the ideal of Western humanism. Notice Goethe's term resolute. I think it should be translated resolutely, but Berenson has translated it manfully. What does this word really mean, and why does Goethe use it? Perhaps because we never know for sure if our lives have meaning, if we're doing the right thing. So living requires a certain decisiveness, a certain resolution. Perhaps this is why Goethe uses the word resolute. Even though we're not certain, we must choose a course of action and pursue it. We must be resolute. Goethe is telling us to live resolutely in the good, the whole, and the beautiful. If I can use an analogy, imagine someone who's playing tennis. He doesn't know for sure if this is what he should be doing. He doesn't know for sure if there's any meaning in the game. But once he's on the court, he plays as hard as he can. He plays resolutely. For Goethe, the whole, the good, and the beautiful meant an interest in nature as well as art. Goethe was a scientist as well as an artist. He was even involved in what might be called the life of action, serving as a government cabinet member. So for Berenson, Goethe was the best exemplar of the good life of the Western humanist ideal. Berenson felt that among painters, Raphael had best expressed the Western humanist ideal. Berenson said that Raphael's paintings offer the noblest models for mankind to attain, models of realizable and never impossible states of being and ways of living. Raphael's Disputa, School of Athens, and Parnassus seem now, as they did 50 years ago, the clearest and most convincing visions of the perfect existence for which we yearn and which we hope to attain. Let's look at Raphael's School of Athens. Notice that Berenson doesn't praise it for its tactile values, but rather for depicting a model society, 
a model life, a perfect existence. Notice also that Berenson says it's an attainable life, not an impossible life. Beyond where we are now, perhaps, but not beyond where we hope to go. The ideal that Raphael depicts is the Western humanist ideal, the pursuit of truth and beauty, the ennobling of society and of the individual. It's this ideal that was battered and almost destroyed by the two world wars and by the counterculture movement of the 60s. And it's this ideal that Clark tried to revive with his documentary, Civilization. The subject of the School of Athens is philosophy, and its caption is Knowledge of Causes. The painting is called the School of Athens because most Greek philosophical schools were based in Athens, though most Greek philosophers were born outside Athens. At the center of the painting are Plato and Aristotle. Plato is on the left and is clearly the older man. He's holding one of his books, the Timaeus, while Aristotle is holding one of his books, the Ethics. Plato, who's known for emphasizing pure ideas, points toward the sky, the heavens, while Aristotle, who's known for his scientific bent, gestures toward the earth. The figure of Plato is based on Leonardo da Vinci. If we compare the figure of Plato with Leonardo's self-portrait, there's a close resemblance. Socrates is shown in a greenish cloak on the left side of the painting. Raphael depicts himself in the lower right. Notice also the role of architecture in the painting, the arches, the coffered ceilings, the statues. This painting, The School of Athens, is by a Renaissance painter, Raphael. Renaissance architects followed classical models, perhaps because they believed that the ancients had lived the good life, and the good life should have a certain setting. It should be lived in certain surroundings. Or perhaps Renaissance architects had been taught to find beauty in the classical style, so they felt that arches and coffered ceilings were beautiful. Until recently, our society also built in a classical style. In the early 1900s, for example, Grand Central Station and Penn Station were built in a classical style. Let's look at a picture of Penn Station, which was, which was built in Manhattan in 1910 and demolished in 1963. What we find in Penn Station is what we found in Raphael's School of Athens, arches, coffered ceilings, columns, a feeling of space. In fact, one might say that the real Penn Station was grander than Raphael's imaginary space. Penn Station was modeled after an ancient structure, the Baths of Caracalla in Rome. If we look at a picture of the Baths of Caracalla, we can see a resemblance to Penn Station. Let's look at a short video about Penn Station. The description is by the American novelist Thomas Wolfe. The station was murmurous with the immense and distant sound of time. Great slanted beams of moted light fell ponderously athwart the station's floor, and the calm voice of time hovered along the walls and ceiling of that mighty room distilled out of the voices and movements of the people who swarmed beneath. Here, as nowhere else on earth, men were brought together for a moment, at the beginning or end of their innumerable journeys. Here one saw their greetings and farewells. Here, in a single instant, one got the entire picture of human destiny. Men came and went, they passed and vanished. All were moving through the moments of their lives. But the voice of time remained aloof and unperturbed, a drowsy and eternal murmur below the immense and distant roof. Thomas Wolfe. Clearly, Wolf is inspired by the building, inspired by the architectural setting. He calls it a mighty room, and he speaks of the immense and distant roof. Henry James said that literature lifts up the heart. Clearly, Thomas Wolfe was uplifted by Penn Station, and surely many people have been uplifted by Raphael's School of Athens. 
All branches of culture work toward the same goal, to uplift, to make life richer, more interesting. Hence, Kenneth Clark deals with all branches of culture in his documentary, Civilization. Hence, nine people wrote to him and said that his documentary had steered them away from suicide. Notice that Clark's approach is the opposite of academia's approach. While Clark brings all the branches of culture together, academia divides culture into separate departments. Clark integrates, academia specializes. People like Clark and Goethe are always connecting culture to life. Academia looks at technical matters that are divorced from life. For example, instead of looking at the uplifting quality of literature, academia would discuss narrative techniques. Instead of discussing how Raphael presents a vision of the good life, academia would analyze Raphael's brushstrokes. Academia loses the forest for the trees. I wrote a book called Realms of Gold, a sketch of Western literature, and I sent a copy to Stephen Sage, a scholar and former professor. He wrote to me and said, why do you continually talk about whether books are enjoyable or not? Being a professional scholar, Sage couldn't understand why enjoyment matters. But I'm not a professional scholar, I'm a layman, and for me, enjoyment is the most important thing. Clark's attitude was the same as mine. He valued enjoyment above all. In his early years, Clark was fond of Chinese poetry and Japanese prints. He said that his fondness for Japanese prints confirmed my belief that nothing could destroy me as long as I could enjoy works of art. And for enjoy, read enjoy, not codify or classify, just enjoy. From this hedonist position, I have never departed. Note the contrast between Clark and Stephen Sage. Clark was a humanist, an integrator, and he valued culture for the enjoyment it provides. Stephen Sage is a PhD, a former academic, a professional scholar, and he can't understand why enjoyment matters at all. Let's come back to Raphael's School of Athens. Such a painting not only provides enjoyment, it also conveys the idea that the good life is possible. If not today, then tomorrow. If not here, then in Penn Station. If not here, then at Berenson's estate outside Florence. One of the most influential writers on art was John Ruskin, who died in 1900. Ruskin argued that the artist should create with enjoyment. His work shouldn't be drudgery. He should put his heart into it. He should express himself, not just follow orders. Ruskin emphasizes enjoyment as much as Clark does, but Ruskin doesn't discuss only the enjoyment of the observer. He also discusses the enjoyment of the creator, the artist. Ruskin was a champion of Gothic architecture. He felt that medieval craftsmen expressed themselves in their work. They worked with enjoyment. Their gargoyles and ornaments were carved with love. Ruskin wrote, I believe the right question to ask respecting all ornament is simply this. Was it done with enjoyment? Was the carver happy while he was about it? It may be the hardest work possible, and the harder because so much pleasure was taken in it. But it must have been happy too, or it will not be living. When we talk about the life-enhancing function of culture, we should consider the artist as well as the observer, the writer as well as the reader. The enjoyment of the artist communicates itself to the observer and becomes a part of the observer's enjoyment. Clark himself is an example of this. Clark enjoyed making his documentary. He said that the most enjoyable years in his long life were those in which he was making his documentary civilization. Clark wrote, it seems ridiculous to say that the happiest years of my life took place when I was 68, but so it was. Perhaps Clark's enjoyment communicates itself to the viewer and helps to explain the popularity of his documentary. In earlier videos, I discussed my theory of history and my theory of renaissance and decadence. I argued that a renaissance is an expression of the life instinct in society, while decadence expresses the death instinct. Now I'm arguing that culture is life-enhancing, life-enriching. Are these two ideas connected? 
Does the Renaissance artist create life-enhancing art because he has a strong life instinct? The French writer Stendhal said that beauty is a promise of happiness. Beauty in any branch of culture enriches life. Beauty says that the good life is possible. Happiness is possible. Let's look at how one novel makes a promise of happiness. Let's look at The Brothers Karamazov by Dostoevsky. Dostoevsky says that we often feel anger and resentment, but a positive attitude is possible. Happiness is possible. Rakuten turned into a back alley and walked away. As long as he thinks of the offenses he has suffered, he will always be turning off into back alleys. But there is a bright, wide open road, a straight road, shining like crystal, leading to the sun. A few chapters later in the same novel, Dostoevsky describes a conversation between Alyosha, who's about 20 years old, and Kolya, who's about 12. Alyosha says, listen, Kolya, there will be times in your life when you'll be very unhappy. I know, I know, but it's so strange the way you can tell things in advance. But on the whole, you'll be pleased with your life. Alyosha is promising Kolya happiness. Stendhal said that beauty is a promise of happiness, and Dostoevsky's character is making that very promise. Alyosha is telling Kolya that he'll be pleased with his life, that he'll find happiness. Remember Nietzsche's comment, there is no such thing as pessimistic art, art affirms. In the Brothers Karamazov, Dostoevsky affirms. Dostoevsky promises happiness. By the way, uh, if you want to give any feedback on the show, we have an email address, which is today at ljhammond.com, and there's a website, ljhammond.com slash today. If you go to that website, you'll get more information about the people that we're discussing. That's all for today. Uh, thank you for watching. <laughs>